I took my son for a walk just the other day, just down from our house, past a church. And this church is named after its founder, the founder of this movement, the founder of this church. Very prominent man in Protestant circles, lived around the 1500s, if I'm, if I'm giving you enough clues. And yet, this church had words on its marquee which would have made the founder of this movement roll over in his grave. Now, I am not trying to paint with too broad a brush. I know that not everyone who calls themselves by this name would endorse what this particular local very uh, variety uh, of this movement put on its marquee. I know that there are members that would not endorse that view, but it, it shook me. I could hardly believe what's I can hardly believe what's happening before our very eyes. And I want to give you some earmarks. What can we look for to see if a church is apostatizing? These are five things that came to my mind pretty quickly as I as I gave it some thought. No, we'll go through those immediately. Refusal to preach the gospel. These are churches that will preach motivational speeches, they'll talk about all sorts of other things, but they refuse to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the kind of gospel that is given freely by grace, but it's also a transformative gospel. It's a gospel that is a vibrant and living thing that has the power to change you and to transform you as well. Any church that is turning the grace of God into uh, licentiousness or lasciviousness is not preaching the true gospel of God. Number one, they refuse to preach the gospel. Instead, they substitute um, motivational speeches. And uh, one scripture says, great swelling words of vanity. They, They... insert their own ideas, their own ideologies, their own psychology, their own counseling, their own thoughts, rather than preaching the gospel of Christ. Number two, these churches are man-centered. And I'm not wading into the debate right now between Arminianism and Calvinism. What I'm talking about is a church that is focused on a man. It can circle around a particular personality, or it can circle around the man in the pew, as if the gospel were all about that particular individual. Not about Jesus Christ, not about God, not about exalting God, not about God's glory, not about lifting up God, but rather exalting the man. People who will preach these kinds of messages will stress the inner greatness of the individual who sits in the pew, rather than stress the greatness of our God. They are man-centered, and maybe they aren't preaching things that are terrible or horrible immediately, but that will inevitably lead to a decline if they refuse to put God at the center and put man at the center. Number three, these churches are putting darkness for light and light for darkness. They have bought into the, this new morality. Uh, our culture has, has ripped God out of it, has torn out the foundation, and in its place, our culture has put in some sort of new um, morality, a new fad of morality. And these churches will not preach and call sin, sin. These churches will not say what the Bible says when it comes to sin. What the Bible calls sin, they will call good. Or they'll avoid ever talking about subjects that make modern people uncomfortable. I think we need to get our morality out of the scriptures. It needs to be derived, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we can't substitute our own morality for what morality is given us in the scriptures. Number four, these churches have become worldly. There's no distinction in many of these churches between people that live in the world and, the, and people that go to these kind of churches. Now, I'm not saying 
that we should sit here and have a holier than thou spirit or attitude. I don't mean that at all. But when there's no preaching to teach people that we need to avoid the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, if we embrace those things as wholeheartedly as the world does, and there's no distinction between those that have been called out by Jesus by, by Jesus, and have been sanctified by his blood, if there's no distinction or no difference there, what good is it? What does it mean when Jesus says that we're to be a city that is set on a hill which cannot be hid? What does it mean when Jesus says that we're to be the light of the world? What does it mean when he says that we're to be the salt of the earth? If the salt has lost its savor, it is henceforth good for nothing. And this is what happens in, apost- in apostate churches. Number five, there is a a fear, a cowardice in the pulpit, a fear to say what the Bible actually teaches in regards to the wrath of God. Now, we certainly need to emphasize the love of God, and God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The love of God is important and valuable, but there has to be something that is in our evangelism that echoes what was in Paul's evangelism, when Paul could reason of righteousness and of faith and of judgment to come. He reasoned such that Felix trembled. I think that the evangelistic efforts of so many now wouldn't cause anyone to tremble because they've deleted the teaching of the wrath of God. There is a wrath that is coming. There is a coming wrath that is that is uh, that is coming upon this world and we need to escape that wrath and we're being beckoned by a god that does love us and wants us to escape that wrath but true believers have not been appointed to wrath and paul in another place says knowing the terror of the lord we persuade men one day each one of us are going to appear before the judgment seat of christ and if we have not aligned ourselves with the gospel of jesus christ then that is a fearful and dreadful day and churches that have apostatized have forgotten that there is a coming wrath and we need to preach that. Why? Because the apostles preached it. I'm not saying we leave aside the love of God, God's great compassions, his mercies which are new every morning, his faithfulness, all those other things. We need to have all those other pieces, but some churches have turned down the volume on the wrath of God so much that never in their evangelistic efforts would anyone tremble like Felix trembled when Paul reasoned of the judgment to come. So, I think that we're living in perilous times, and it's time for us to pursue the Lord wholeheartedly, uncompromisingly, because so many are compromising, and the light that was once among Christian people and in Christian churches is now dimming. We need to brighten up the light. Let the salt be salty. Let the church be the church.